Last week, Pastor Jason shared a powerful message on honoring one another as we sort of kicked off our One Another's series. And we gave out to each of you this card. And this card is all about the discipline of neighboring. It's steps every week that you can take to practice the discipline of neighboring, the discipline of how to love one another well. And so last week, our challenge was to honor someone in our family of origin. How did you do? Did you do it? Some of you are like, yes. Some of you are like, no. Listen, if you didn't do it, that's okay. You can do it this week. There's no timeline on this. If you did not get this card last week, make sure you get one. Put it on your fridge. Put it in your Bible. Check off. But be intentional about practicing the discipline of neighboring. I chose to honor my dad last week, and I chose to honor him because, as many of you know, my mom had a stroke at the end of May, and so my dad has been absolutely amazing, coming alongside her, caring for her so well. She's doing very well. She is in recovery. There's a long road ahead for sure, but we thank you so much for those of you who have known and those of you who have prayed for us, and especially those in Heartstrong who have come alongside my mom. We so, so appreciate all of those prayers. Well, this week, we're going to be talking about not judging one another from Romans 14, 13. And our anchor scripture is this. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. And so, I want to ask you to do something on the onset of this message, but it's going to be really, really hard. We know that the scriptures say that the road to life, Jesus said this, the road to life is narrow and hard, but it is a road that leads to life. So I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to be hard today in light of this message. I'm going to ask you to focus on yourself. I'm going to ask you not to think about all the people who need to hear this message about stopping to judge. I want you to stop thinking about all the people that you want to tell you need to stop judging me. And I want you to really focus on what Jesus is asking us to do and how he's asking us to live. But it's going to take a lot of discipline. Your mind is going to go to so many things that you want to complain about, that you want to judge, that you want to be right about. But I'm going to ask you just for this next 30 minutes to discipline yourself because I believe the Holy Spirit has something powerful for each and every one of us about how we are called to live. But we're going to have to pray if we're going to do this because we can't do it in our own strength. So Holy Spirit, we ask you to come. We ask you to help us to focus on what you need us to understand about what your word says. We thank you that you promise that even though it's going to be hard, that the hard road is the road that leads to life. And we receive, we want to receive a fresh infilling of life today. So Jesus, we ask you to help us. Holy Spirit, we ask you to help us have your way. We trust you. We give you our hearts and we trust you to have your way in our lives today in Jesus name. And everybody said, okay. All right, let's do this. So in the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament, they were mostly written in Greek. This term, alion, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but alion, it appears about 100 times in 94 verses broken down into about 59 different sets of instructions. So alion is most often translated into English as one another, reciprocity, mutuality, each other, yourselves, or one to another. And so in the majority of cases, it appears in the form of a command, an expectation, an exhortation, or implication for how God's people are to and not to engage, behave, treat, relate to, respond to, and exist with one another. So the one another's are the how-to's of scripture. In the book of John, Jesus gave us a new commandment that we were to love one another as he loves us. He told us what we were to do, and he showed us an example of how to do it. And these 59 different instructions are the how-tos to fulfill this new commandment. Now, of these 59 different one another's that we see in the scripture, there are only seven that are what not to do. A couple of these include don't grumble against one another, don't let us not become conceited, do not slander, 
against one another. Do not lie to one another. And this one that we're going to focus on today, stop passing judgment on one another. Now, there's a lot of information and messages and interpretation about what the Bible says about judging one another. And we're not going to have time today to explore every single nuance of this conversation today. But what we will focus on is this, how to stop judging one another. We're going to define what kind of judgment the scriptures are saying to stop doing to one another and where judgment started in the first place. And then we're going to zone in on what Jesus really meant when he instructed us not to judge one another using the story of the adulterous woman from John chapter 8. And lastly, how to hold all of this intention with what it looks like to rightly judge one another biblically. And so what are you going to do again? You're going to think about how God wants you to live this out. Not about other people, not about those people that are super annoying, that are bothering you, that you can complain about, that are annoying. You're going to think about what God wants to do in your life today. All right. Judgment is a very interesting capacity that the Lord gave humans when he created us. So in the Garden of Eden, before sin stained God's perfect order, God gave Adam and Eve this ability to rule or judge every living thing that crawled on the earth. Never did he say to judge one another. Judgment or rulership was reserved for the things that God had created for mankind to enjoy. And so, before sin entered the world, humans were able to rightly judge from a place of intimate relationship with God, complete submission to God, and total obedience to God's ways. So their good judgment, their right judgment, was from a place of being loved by God, of being created by God. They belonged to God. Their identity was rooted in this. And this enabled Adam and Eve to prioritize each other's well-being, which is what keeps judgment in its right order. However, when sin entered the world, the understanding of good and evil or our ability to judge took on a whole new level. The curse made way for judgment to begin one to another, but this was never the original intent. In Adam and Eve's very first interaction with God after they had sinned was to blame rather than to take ownership for what they had done. Humans went into survival mode. Self-preservation now became the priority. And the rest of the Old Testament is filled with stories that we've seen repeated in our own history as well as our own lives, rooted in, I'm right, you're wrong, us versus them, it's your fault, pride, jealousy, self-righteousness, and self-preservation over the well-being of others have all borne the incredible pain caused by judgment. Whether we see it in the very first story after the fall of Cain and Abel, the first example of jealousy resulting in murder, or entire nations going to war and millions of people losing their lives. Judgment is powerful, it's dangerous and destructive, and the Bible tells us why. Now, as we dive a little deeper into why the scriptures admonish us not to judge one another, let's define what kind of judgment we're referring to. The Bible's not against being judged by the law. In fact, it encourages us to abide by laws, including submission to a justice system, and the Bible encourages healthy discipline within a church body as well. So I'm really sorry to say, but the next time you get pulled over by a police officer, you cannot say to him, stop judging me, officer. (laughs) Sorry, it's not going to (laughs) work. And in the scriptures that we're going to read today, Jesus is talking about judging another person before God, judging their motives, their intentions, their actions, in other words, standing in the place of God to pronounce someone guilty. Now, if somebody wrongs you, like for example, if they hit your car or they steal something from your home or they lie to you about something, it's not judging them to say, you lied to me, you hit my car, you stole something from my home. Judging them would be, would be to say, you are a liar, you are a thief, you are a reckless driver. 
Now, I already hear you arguing a little bit with me in your mind. Like, I, I get this. I, I feel like I'm arguing with myself a little bit in my mind as well. Because what the Bible is getting us to think about when it comes to judgment is this. How do you wish to be judged when you wrong another person? If you yell at your toddler who's acting up in the grocery store, does that make you a bad mom? If I tell a lie, does that make me a liar? Should my new identity be Lori the liar? I don't think so. I don't want people to say that. I don't want people to see that. No, I think you're like me, and we would wish that people would know us as a person who is kind and thoughtful and encouraging, but who told a lie one time. You see, we as humans have these kinds of conditions on the judgments that we make, and this is why it's flawed. I'm going to judge you much more harshly than I want you to judge me. Let me give you an example. So for, and, and this would be exactly how my mindset would be. If an abuser abuses one time, he or she is an abuser. But if someone lies one time, we wouldn't identify them as a liar. Now, even as I say this, I understand this is very complex and layered. And I'm thankful that we live in a country where there are laws in place that protect us from illegal actions that cause harm. I'm grateful for that. But as we continue learning about how to stop judging one another, what I do not want you to do is interpret this in any way as condoning or turning a blind eye to wrongful treatment. We're not gonna have time today to get into how to set boundaries, but if you're in trouble and if you're being abused in any way, please reach out to someone and talk to someone about that. Jesus wants us to Jesus wants to lead us beyond the drive, the instinctual fleshly drive to judge someone for their wrongdoing and learn how our thoughts and actions can actually lead us to our own well-being and the well-being of others. So let's dive into what the scriptures say. We're going to start in Matthew 7, verse 1 to 5. Judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, if I asked you to come up here, and I said to you, I'm gonna slap you across the face, and as hard as I slap you, you can slap me back. What I probably would do in that situation instead would be to give you a hug and hope that you would hug me back. This is not complicated. This is pretty clear. If you're going to judge someone else, you'll be judged by the same measure that you judge. So if you're going to judge, then judge with your eyes wide open. Verse 3 says, why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So what does Jesus mean using this analogy? Jesus is teaching us to see the gravity of our own sin as a log and the gravity of someone else's sin as a speck. Now, sometimes I make Jason come with me into the forest to cut down like tree branches or pompous grass or evergreens because I want to do some decor in my house or I want to, it's actually funny that I said I make him come because I actually do because he would never go do that himself. So I am like, come help me. So he does he'll, and he'll do it. And I'm so thankful. Thank you, Jason, if you're watching. I appreciate when you come with me to cut down trees in the forest. Anyway, so we go there. One time we were cutting down some birch uh, from this dead, you know, a dead birch tree had fallen. We were cutting some branches off that I wanted to use in some Christmas decor. And a speck uh, came off of, he was using a chainsaw, and a speck came off and went right into my eye. And I was like, like, it was awful. If you have ever had like a like a speck that's like larger than a dot go into, like it's, you cannot, I couldn't open either of my eyes. It was absolutely terrible. He's like trying to blow it out. It was awful. It was absolutely 
awful. It doesn't matter if you have a log or a speck in your eye, both are going to impair your vision. However, the weight of our own sin before God should be that of the weight of a log compared to the weight of a speck. And I like to call this radical ownership. And I want you to say radical ownership. But instead, what do we do? We get all worked up about what other people are doing. I mean like log size weight worked up. And then we justify our own wrongdoing as though it's as tiny as a little speck. And this can be with anything. Bad drivers, bad supervisors, inconsiderate teenagers, not mine of course, maybe. The government, taxes, you name it. But we get like log size weight worked up about so many things. And this is where the measure comes back. When we judge by the weight of a log, that's the measure that comes back to us. And so what Jesus is ruling out here is where pride makes us see that the sin of others is the weight of a log, judging people for their actions and their intentions and their motives instead of rightly judging our own sin before removing the speck in someone else's eye. This is what we are to stop doing to one another. All right, there's one more scripture I wanna unpack here. Luke 6, 37 and 38. This is Jesus again talking. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, this scripture, again, is super clear. Don't be judgy, and you won't feel judged back. But this scripture ups the ante of what will happen instead of us giving judgment if we give life and grace and forgiveness. We're gonna be measured by our judgment or by our giving. It's a choice that has different results. When you seek the well-being of others, the Bible's describing like a container filled with grain to represent this visual. And this is what's being unpacked in this scripture. What we give to one another is given back to us. And the benefits of this from God are for you. And that's why I want you to focus on you in this message. The benefits of living this way are for you. And so the result is when you give, it will be given by God, not by the other person. That's really important to mention because sometimes we give expecting something in return. And sometimes we get really upset when we give and we give and we give and we don't get anything back in return. No, the scripture is very clear. It will be given to you by God. And it says in good measure, which means generously, in abundance, pressed down, filling all of the space of the container, shaken so that the grain will settle and more can be placed into the container, running over. It actually describes a heap over top of the container. If you can imagine your life as a container and God pouring so much that it's actually spilling out. And the scriptures actually say, one uses their shirt as another container to hold all the blessings that God wants to pour out onto you. For the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. In other words, God richly blesses those that give abundantly. According to this, we would be absolutely crazy not to follow this. But what's most difficult is that we're often so blinded by our own sinful motives or those logs that are sticking out of our eyes. Because the truth is that when I judge you, I'm being wise and righteous, right? And when you judge me, you're being fleshly and hurtful. Isn't that how we feel? We feel justified to judge one another, but actually what we're doing is we're hitting each other over the head with a log when we judge them. And then we take offense almost 100% of the time when we're being judged. 
probably because it actually feels like we're being hit over the head with a big log. No wonder we have such a hard time getting along with each other. We've got to stop hitting each other over the head with logs. Now, leading experts in relationships teach that if you need to confront something about something that's going on in your life, someone that's hurting you or harming you, that it's more effective to use I statements. You see, judgment is one of the greatest barriers to relationship and to intimacy and to truly being known. And so what's effective about using I statements in relationships is I statements don't assume judgment on what happened. I statements take responsibility for how said action made you feel. They de-escalate the conversation and help reduce a defensive response. Now, everybody hates being judged or criticized for their driving. Just, can I, can I see your hand? Like, how do you feel when you're driving and someone in the passenger seat is just making comments about, yeah, no, no, everybody hates this. And yet we all do it. We all do this. And, and like, I don't like when Jason judges my driving, and he does. He judges my driving sometimes. And so I choose to let him drive more because I really don't like hearing about how he thinks I should be driving. And listen, listen, I can take full ownership that, yes, sometimes when I'm driving, I can get a little distracted. I like my music really loud. Sometimes when I'm turning, I can, like, sideswipe the curb maybe a lot you know the back one the but listen I drive a Jeep so I just call that off-roading I just it's made my Jeep's made for that but listen I've got my own judgments about his driving too and I thought about this and I thought maybe I could use some I statements to talk about his driving with him so we'll give it a try here so it could go something like this. I feel anxious when you drive so close to other cars. I don't know, maybe. I feel confused when you take the long way to get somewhere. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. What do you think? No? Maybe not? Okay, okay. But seriously, like, this is an example of what I mean and how I statements can be really effective. So here is just a real feeling about how I feel sometimes about my kids. I might want to say to them, why do you leave the house without telling me where you're going? You're so so irresponsible, you're only thinking about yourself. And that might be true, but it is very judgmental and probably not going to be well received. So an I statement might be, and a more effective way to say, I worry when you leave the house and I don't know where you are. I love you and I want to know that you are safe. So there you go. There's an example of how I statements can be more effective in our communication because most of us live afraid to be judged. It keeps people from coming to church. It keeps people from joining a team, a club, a group, a class, Bible school, trying something new, learning a new skill. We don't want to be judged, and yet it's something we have no control over. We actually can't control whether someone is gonna judge us or not. We've got no power in that space, so we avoid anything where we fear we might experience judgment. And although this message is focused on today how to stop judging one another, it is important for us to be able to take ownership of how much we're allowing the judgment of others to take up space and energy inside of our lives. Because if you're not doing things like good things, like things you should be doing because you're afraid of judgment, you need to get to the bottom of that because you're letting other people's judgments take up way too much space and energy in your head. Let them talk. Let them judge. It honestly says more about them anyways. So get back to church. Get back to the gym. Change that job. Follow that dream. Don't let the fear of judgment stop you from doing the things that you need to do that are good for you and good for your well-being. All right. We're going to get back to how we actually stop judging one another. In a story of Jesus, of what he did from John chapter 8, verses 3 to 11. And if you have your Bibles, you can open it up there. Otherwise, you can just listen as I read this story. 
The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who'd been caught in adultery, placing her in the midst. They said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? And this they said to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Now, one could argue in this story that the scribes and the Pharisees were rightly judging this woman. She was caught in the very act of adultery. She did it. She was guilty. And one could argue that they were addressing something that needed to be addressed. She broke the law, and so she needed to pay for what she had done. There was a consequence for that in this time. But Jesus, who's perfectly righteous and full of immeasurable grace, rightly judges the situation. Let's see what he does. It says, Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to ask him, he stood up and he said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. You see, Jesus took an approach of radical ownership. If you are without sin, then go ahead, cast the first stone. And interestingly enough, not one of them could do it. And these were supposed to be the holiest of holy men of the day, and even they were not without sin. And this is an incredible moment because Jesus could have thrown the first stone. He was perfect, he was without sin, and even Jesus chose not to throw any stones, even though in that time, that was the punishment for the crime. Now, when I think about this story, my blood begins to boil because I think about this woman who's being publicly shamed and, and, and threatened to be stoned, and where was the man that she was caught in the very act of adultery with? You see, my human fleshly mind wants to go right to the other side of judgment. And I feel powerful and self-righteous in this judgment. How could they humiliate and use their power to humiliate this woman? Don't they see their hypocrisy? I'm standing up for a victim here, right? And yet, even Jesus doesn't judge them either. He simply asks them to check their hearts. Are you without sin? Grace for the woman caught in adultery and grace for the men who accused her. This is tough. This is really tough stuff. But this is exactly what the gospel leads us towards. Radical ownership for what we have done. Hating our sin more than we hate the sin of others. Forgiving those who have hurt us so that we can be free. Why? Because we've already been forgiven. We've already received love. We've been given so much grace. All judging does is it robs and it kills and it destroys relationships. And what do the scriptures say? A thief comes to rob, steal, and destroy. But Jesus came to give us abundant life. The story ends like this. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go, and now sin no more. Romans 8 verses 1 to 2 says, there is therefore now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of the spirit of death. And when we judge one another, we choose the way of death and law rather than the way of grace. You see, judgment, it makes us feel powerful, but grace enables us to take radical ownership. Judgment, it makes us feel right, but grace enables us to be made right. Judgment makes us feel protected, but grace enables us to be safe. And judgment makes us feel better than someone else but grace enables us to live humbly. So which do you want to be measured by today? Grace or judgment? So then how do we rightly judge someone according to the Bible? The Bible does talk about this, and we can see in the life of Jesus that he definitely does use righteous judgment. 
The Bible encourages appropriate evaluation, accountability and responsibility for wrongs done, admonishment for those in the family of God, discernment over the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit, correction in love, but bi biblical judgment should only be given by the one who feels truly grieved by his own log-sized sin, because only then can he remove the speck in his brother's eye. Let's take a look again at our anchor text and see what it's showing us what we should do instead of judging one another. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother and a sister. In order to genuinely lean into this space from love, we're going to go back to the beginning again and look how God first intended it to be. You see, before sin entered the world, humans were able to rightly judge from a place of intimate relationship with God, complete submission to God, and total obedience to God's ways. Their good judgment was from a place of being created and loved by God. They belonged to God. Their identity was rooted in love. And we must truly anchor into the love of God, recognition of our own sin, humility, and servanthood before we lean into this space with others. But this is tough, and we get it wrong a lot. Historically, this might be one of the greatest places of damage that the church has been accused of, wrongly and hypocritically handling judgment, being a literal stumbling block for others to follow Jesus. If someone has judged you in a way that has deeply hurt you and it has become a stumbling block for you and there is a literal stumbling block in your way, can I just remind you here today that that person is not Jesus? And I'm so sorry that that has happened to you and I'm sorry that you've been hurt in a way that, that literally has put a stumbling block in your following Jesus. But would you allow Jesus to heal you today? with his love and his grace, because the enemy would love for that stumbling block to stay right in your way for the rest of your life. But today, today, if you allow Jesus to heal you just like he did that woman who was brought before the religious leaders of the day, if you allow Jesus to heal you today, you can walk out of here free. There was a time when I needed to speak to a leader about something that was going on in their life, and they had told me in an earlier conversation that, you know, they had a hard time receiving feedback, but for some reason I put this out of my mind and I still kind of leaned in with some pretty direct feedback, and it caused a huge stumbling block for this person. And although I came back around and I owned what I had done, I recognized it, it still was a stumbling block for them, and I have to live with that. And I tell you that today to say sometimes we do get this wrong, even when we mean well, even when we believe we're doing it out of love. But there are a few steps that you can take when you're at odds with a brother or sister that we find in the scriptures. Number one, first pray about it. Number two, go to them and prioritize their well-being. Use I statements when you're talking to them and share with humility and ownership and forgive them. The, the Bible says that if this does not work, then bring somebody else along and have that conversation again for the purpose of reconciliation. But even before you go to someone, spend time with Jesus. Check your heart and take the log out. Completely submit to Jesus' ways. Live in total obedience. And from that place, you'll be able to rightly discern how to judge your brother or your sister. The last thing I want to say on this subject is the church has historically turned a blind eye on things that have needed to be called out, especially in leadership. And I want you to know here today that we will not be a church who will publicly humiliate people for their sin because we truly believe that he who is without sin can cast the first stone, which is none of us. 
However, I do want you to know that if or when destructive sin issues come to light in our staff team, in our leadership here, we do address those things with the hope of restoration, of healing and recovery for the well-being of that person. And sometimes when we address these things, it leads to someone needing to step down for a season, giving up certain parts of their leadership, or even having to leave ministry altogether. And sometimes these are necessary for a fruitful healing journey. Pastor Barry always told us, stay away from the three Gs. Stay away from the girls, the guys, the gold, and the glory. Those are the things that you need to stay away from. And we have walked a healing journey with leaders from things like adultery, pornography addictions, addictions of all kinds, burnout, marriage reconciliation, control, and abuse. And these are never easy, but most of the time as we lean into these spaces, we see much fruit. And so you can trust that we will not sweep sin under the carpet in leadership here. We will address it in a spirit of gentleness and allow someone to continue and not allow someone to continue leading if there is a major sin struggle in their life. Galatians 6, 1 said, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. You know, Jason and I, we lead from a place of great vulnerability we and our whole staff team. We do not believe for one second that we are above falling, above failing, above falling into a moral failure or a sin struggle. So we live vigilant, vigilantly aware of the enemy's schemes in our lives, putting on the armor of God every day and walking humbly before the Lord. And we are definitely in no way perfect, but we do have accountability both inside and outside of the church and we will do our best with the help of the Holy Spirit to continue to lead Life Center with integrity and humility and to be vigilant to deal with our sin and our brokenness as the Lord leads us. And this is my solemn vow. I love you very, very much. It is an honor to be your pastor. Bless you today.